Hi, everyone. My name is Arthur Sineo. Thank you for taking time to watch this presentation today. The title of my presentation is The Future of Persistent Memory, DRAM, and SSD Form Factors Aligned with New System Architectures. So let's get started. Modern data workloads require real-time processing of large data sets resident in main memory for the highest performance. Memory capacity has not scaled compared to the number of CPU cores available in modern day servers. CPU core processing power has scaled beyond what can be supported with synchronous DDR memory as shown in the chart on the left. CPUs are pin limited now, continuously adding more pins to keep increasing the number of DDR channels to the CPUs and fully utilize the processing, processing power is not feasible. The number of DRAM and PCIe channels cannot be increased due to the high number of pins required to match the increase in CPU processing capability. The memory and I.O. bandwidth per core measured in gigabytes per second has been steadily dropping over the years as shown on the chart on the right. Tightly coupled synchronous CPU DRAM server architecture is no longer scalable. The only alternative is to move from a parallel bus to a serialized memory interface. The disaggregation of the CPU and the DRAM are now allowing applications and server hardware to drive form factors best suited for adding cache coherent serial or fabric attached memory. The options for memory expansion and system acceleration have expanded and are aligning with emergent serial and fabric attached architectures as shown in the diagram. For 2019, we see that memory is directly attached to the CPU. Now, in 2021 and 2022, we have new interfaces that add high-speed differential CPU-attached options that are also cache coherent, as shown by the dotted line. So we have CXL, C6, and others that we'll be discussing. Different types of memory, persistent memory, and storage can be added depending on the application needs and the server hardware. The C CXL, C6, and OpenCAPI interconnect standards allow more memory and persistent memory to be serially attached to the CPU to accommodate larger and larger data workload requirements. Lastly, we have fabric attached architectures such as Gen Z and CXL 2.0, which further expand the memory, persistent memory, storage, and other options. Systems will be aware of what type of memory or storage is available and how it is connected. Many new types of memory, storage, and acceleration products are possible. At a high level, this is a snapshot of the form factor migration. The current M.2 form factors shown on the top left have certain limitations. For example, limited scaling for power and thermals. There are also some performance and capacity limitations since all the die cannot be activated at the same time. Another concern is that is that it's not hot pluggable. So this is not to say that the M.2 is being abandoned though. The E1.S EDSFF specification from SNEA has addressed those limitations as we will discuss. Similarly, the U.2 form factor on the, on the bottom left has also has some limitations. It has limited support and scalability for higher speeds. The E3, the E3 EDSFF form factor specifications enable better cooling than the U.2 and addresses scalability. The E1 and E3 form factor use cases are expanding and being adopted for DRAM memory, persistent memory, and other functions, utilizing the new interconnect standards, as we'll discuss. There are a number of challenges in adding more memory to a server. Let's take a look first at performance when comparing these form factors. The PCB real estate is saturated. There is no room to add more DDR DIMM slots next to the CPU sockets. Increasing the data rate of electrical interfaces like the DDR bus 
increases the cost of manufacturing and adds to other engineering challenges. It is increasingly difficult to allocate more pins on the CPU sockets for DDR-like parallel interfaces, as was shown in the first slide. Therefore, the industry is moving towards attaching memory to a serial interfaces like the PCIe bus and the LMI interface. Let's compare the performance between a PCIe interface and a DDR4 bus. In the current generation on the first row, the PCIe Gen 4 by 16 interface on an E3.S device exceeds the performance of DDR4 at 3200. You can also achieve similar throughput by connecting multiple E1.S devices in parallel. In the future generations, uh, on the second row, the PCIe Gen 5 based interfaces like E1.S with a by 8 and a 2C connector or the E3.S with a by 16 and a 4C connector will exceed DDR4 data rates and will be comparable to DDR5 throughput. So this demonstrates that memory connected through a serial interface can match and even surpass the performance of a DDR4 bus running at the highest speed. The increased number of channels associated with serial interfaces solves the bandwidth problem as we'll see in an upcoming slide. Another challenge is latency. High-speed access to memory and persistent memory is critical in transforming raw data into usable information. On the left are the DIMMs and NVDIMMs. They have the lowest latency, less than uh, 100 nanoseconds and they typically provide up to hundreds of gigabytes of memory. In the middle are the serial attached form factor options providing less than 350 nanoseconds of latency with the exception of the differential DIM, which is at about 40 nanoseconds. These solutions provide hundreds of gigabytes to terabytes of memory. On the right is the net, are the network attached Gen Z options and the CXL 2.0 the latency will be less than approximately 1,000 nanoseconds and providing terabytes to petabytes of memory capacity. The final challenge is form factor. Serial interfaces have multiple advantages over parallel interfaces. The biggest one is that serial interfaces have fewer pins than parallel interfaces like DDR4 or DDR5. This slide compares a 288-pin DDR4 DIMM connector with an E1.S EDSFF connector following the SNEA specification. The first row in the table compares the number of pins in, in both connectors. The E1.S 1C connector has only one-fifth the total number of pins in comparison to a 288-pin standard DDR4 DIMM connector. If we compare only high-speed data E1.S has 75% fewer data pins compared to a DDR4 DIMM. Even the one E1.S with 2C connector, similar to the PCIe by 8, has half the number of high-speed data pins versus a 288-pin DDR4 DIMM. If we compare the size and the area occupied by the connectors on the PCB, as shown in the second row on the table, the E1.S connector takes about 20% the board space compared to a DDR4 DIMM connector. This indicates that the board designers can accommodate up to four E1.S connectors for every one DDR4 DIMM socket. Having fewer high-speed signals will reduce the complexity of the PCB board design. In addition, E1.S connectors can be placed away from the CPU sockets because serial interfaces can be routed over long distances on the system PCB. This frees up space on the server system. Simplifying system PCB manufacturing improves yields and helps drive new technology adoption by lowering costs. Accessing memory over serial interfaces is a win-win situation for both CPU silicon manufacturers as well as board designers. Now, bringing this all together, this example configuration demonstrates how higher bandwidth can be achieved where computing and memory scale independently. This example is showing the transition from a 64-core DDR4 CPU to a 96-core DDR5 CPU with CXL added. 
But DDR4, the configuration is shown with 12 channels and 24 128 gigabyte RDIMs, providing uh, three terabytes of memory. The theoretical maximum bandwidth in this case is 614 gigabytes per second, and the bandwidth per core comes out to approximately 4.79 gigabytes per second. Now, transitioning to DDR5 with a 96 core CPU, the diagram on the right is showing eight CXL links, each one using a 256 gigabyte E3.S DRAM module. This adds approximately 252 gigabytes per second of bandwidth. The DDR5 bandwidth is shown as 768 gigabytes per second, also using 12 channels, in this case with 24 128 gigabyte DDR5 RDIMs. Combining these provides a total of approximately 5.3 gigabytes per second per core with a higher number of, uh, of cores in this case. The addition of serial attached memory like CXL guarantees that the system will not be the bottleneck by will not be bottlenecked by memory. Bringing this back to the chart on the slide two, showing the memory and I/O bandwidth, that it shows that this bottleneck has has been eliminated, a significant performance improvement. Serial attached serial interfaces such as CXL enable the flexibility to add a variety of memory types without impacting standard DIMMs. Many logical links can be supported depending on the needed bandwidth. Note that the data here are theoretically calculated uh, based on DDIM system performance. All right, the next few slides provide a more detailed profile of the different form factor options. The first one is the E1.S, typically for memory acceleration and E1.L for memory expansion. These are targeted for use in 1U servers. The table summarizes the host interface, the memory capacity, the protocols that can, that can be used, and the power profiles. There are multiple profiles ranging from 12 volts, uh, 12 volts, 16 volts, 20 volts, or excuse me, watts, and 25 watts. The E1 modules are completely bus powered with 12 volts as a main supply and 3.3 volts as auxiliary supply. As you can see from the picture, many E1.S or E1.L modules can fit into the front of a 1U server and provide cache, a cache coherent connection to the CPU. These can improve performance and provide system acceleration by offloading fixed fun functions like encryption, compression or key value semantics to the E1 memory modules. Okay, next moving to the E3.S and E3.L. These are used primarily for memory expansion in 2U and larger servers. They can enable between four terabytes and eight terabytes of memory expansion with up to 16 E3.S modules in a single 2U server achieving better throughput than direct attached DDR4 DIMMs. There are two profiles, uh, 25 watt for the thin and 40 watt for the thick for the E3.S. The, E3 the E3 modules are also completely bus powered with 12 volts, with main supply and 3.3 as auxiliary supply. Note that the uh, E3 form factor is an ideal candidate to add the non-volatile persistent memory feature, very similar to NVDIMs, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. Uh, next, we have the the EDIM, the differential DIM. The DDR4 differential DIM follows the Open Memory Interface Standard, OMI, which is part of Open, Open CAPI. The DDIM is a transformative memory module that enables a data throughput rate of 25.6 gigabytes per second per lane and a latency of approximately 40 nanoseconds with densities up to 256 gigabytes. The memory bus is defined with one read port and one write port per channel, each having eight unidirectional differential lanes. The 84 pin DDIM is intended for use in standard server environments, utilizing a serial interface and a differential data buffer to significantly expand memory bandwidth.
Then we have the NVDIM. The NVDIMs have been the enabling modules helping to drive the adoption of, of persistent memory. NVDIMs operate the same as registered DIMs and they add high speed byte addressable persistence into main memory. NVDIMs are used in all flash arrays, storage servers, high performance computing platforms, and AI training servers. They are needed for very low latency tiering, caching, write buffering, metadata storage, and checkpointing. And the DIMs are also used for AI and machine learning algorithm processing, which accelerates performance by not having to move the algorithms to flash while they are being developed. And the DIMs are JEDIC standard modules. Specification development is currently underway for DDR5 JEDIC standard NV DIMs. This provides yet another persistent memory form factor option going forward. As mentioned on the previous E3.S slide, NVDIM functionality can be added to the E3.S form factor and used the same way that as an NVDIM, but with the CXL interconnect. The DRAM, flash, and backup power can be combined into a single E3.S module. The non-volatile memory can be managed by the CXL controller on the E3.S module. The E3.S NVXMM CXL memory module can provide the low latency to, to the DRAMs and the persist persistence of NAND flash. So the use case is essentially the same as the NVDIM for very low latency tiering, caching, write buffering, metadata storage, and checkpointing. In this case, there would be no need to use, use up any of the DDR DIM sockets. A CXL-based NVDIM can provide another form factor option for high-speed access to byte addressable persistent memory. So to wrap up, the industry leaders have worked together to standardize EDSFF form factors, which are being adopted for serial attached DRAM memory, persistent memory, and other function, functions using the new interconnect standards. It will now be possible to achieve approximately 7.4 gigabytes per second per core of bandwidth, as an example, with the combination of parallel and serial attached memory. Just one note here that the new form factors do not follow the same process as JEDEX standard DRAM modules with common PCB designs, with the exception of the VDIM. This means that the, the PCB designs for serially connected memory accelerator and expansion modules are different depending on the combinations of suppliers and functions. Compliance testing will be an important element to validate adherence to the interconnect standards. Serial attached cache coherent memory, persistent memory form factors are adding bandwidth, the needed bandwidth necessary to process large data sets. They improve scalability, serviceability, and modularize the introduction of new technologies. So thank you for your time. And if you're interested in jo joining SNEA's persistent memory and NVDIM special interest group, please contact us. We welcome the expansion of this group to discuss and collaborate how these new persistent memory form factors can be evangelized in the industry. Thank you again.